This week, we're going to get into the Torah portion that covers Numbers 22.2 to 25.9. Now, we're at a little bit interesting part of the Torah portion this year because this is the last week and this week is when they tend to combine Parshas and they can get five, six, and seven chapters long. We're not going to read all that. All right, I promise you. But we are going to read Numbers 22.2 to 25.9. And Nathan, if you would come up, then do us the honor, please. Shabbat shalom. shalom. This week is Parsha 40, Balak, starting at Numbers chapter 22, verse 2. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Emori. Moab was very afraid of the people because there were so many of them. Moab was overcome with dread because of the people of Israel. So Moab said to the leaders of Midian, This horde will lick up everything around us the way an ox licks up grass in the field. Balak said to the son of Zippor, Balak the son of Zippor was king of Moab at that time. He sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pator by the Euphrates River in his native land, to tell him, Listen, a people has come out of Egypt, spread over all the land, and settled down next to me. Therefore, please, come and curse this people for me, because they are stronger than I am. Maybe I will be able to strike them down and drive them out of the land. For I know that whomever you bless is in fact blessed and whomever you curse is in fact cursed. The leaders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the payment for divining, came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. He said to them, Stay here tonight, and I will bring you back whatever answer Adonai tells me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent me this message. The people who came out of Egypt have spread over the land. Now, come and curse them for me. Maybe I will be able to fight against them and drive them out. God answered Balaam, you are not to go with them. You are not to curse the people because they are blessed. Balaam got up in the morning and said to the prince, princes of Balak, Return to your own land, because Adonai refuses to give me permission to go with you. The princes of Moab got up, returned to Balak, and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Balak again sent princes, more of them, and of higher status than the first group. They went to Balaam and said to him, Here is what Balak, the son of Zippor, says. Please don't let anything keep you from coming to me. I I will reward you very well. And whatever you say to me, I will do. So please, come and curse this people for me. Balaam answered the servants of Balak, Even if Balak were to give me his palace filled with silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of Adonai my God to do anything, great or small. Now, please, you too, stay here tonight, so that I may find out what else Adonai will say to me. God came to Balaam during the night and said to him, If the men have come to summon you, get up and go with them, but do only what I tell you. So Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But God's anger flared up because he went, and the angel of Adonai stationed himself on the path to bar his way. He was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. The donkey saw the angel of Adonai standing on the road, drawn sword in hand. So the donkey turned off the road into the field, and Bilam had to beat the donkey to get it back on the road. Then the angel of Adonai stood on the road, where it became narrow as it passed among the vineyards and had stone walls on both sides. The donkey saw the angel of Adonai and pushed up against the wall, crushing Bilam's foot against the wall. So he beat it again. The angel of Adonai moved ahead and stood in a place so tight that there was no room to turn either right or left. Again, the donkey saw the angel of Adonai and lay down under Balaam, which made him so angry that he hit the donkey with his stick. 
But Adonai enabled the donkey to speak, and it said to Balaam, What have I done to make you beat me these three times? Balaam said to the donkey, It's because you've been making a fool of me. I wish I had a sword in my hand. I would kill you on the spot. The donkey said to Balaam, I'm your donkey, right? You've ridden me all your life, right? Have I ever treated you like this before? No, he admitted. Then Adonai opened Balaam's eyes so that he could see the angel of Adonai standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed his head and fell on his face. The angel of Adonai said to him, Why did you hit your donkey three times like that? I have come out here to bar your way because you are rushing to oppose me. The donkey saw me and turned aside these three times, and indeed, if she hadn't turned away from me, I would have killed you by now and saved it alive. Balaam said to the angel of Adonai, I have sinned. I didn't know that you were standing on the road to block me. Now, therefore, if what I am doing displeases you, I will go back. But the angel of Adonai said to Balaam, No, go on with the men, but you are to say only what I tell you to say. So Balaam went along with the princes of Balak. When Balak heard that Balaam had come, he went out to meet him in the city of Moab at the Arnon border in the farthest reaches of the territory. Balak said to Balaam, I sent more than once to summon you. Why didn't you come to me? Did you think I couldn't pay you enough? Balaam replied to Balak, Here, I've come to you, but I have no power of my own to say anything. The word that God puts in my mouth is what I will say. Balaam went with Balak. When they arrived at Kiryat Hatzot, Balak sacrificed cattle and sheep, then, went, then sent to Balaam and the princes with him. In the morning, Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal. From there, he could see a portion of the people. Balaam said to Balak, Build me seven altars here, and prepare me seven bulls and seven rams here. Balak did as Balaam said. Then Balak and Balaam offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Balaam said to Balak, Stand by your burnt offering while I go off. Maybe Adonai will come and meet me, and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. He went off to a bare hill. God met Balaam, who said to him, I prepared the seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Adonai put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Go on back to Balak and speak as I tell you. He went back to him, and there, standing by his burnt offering, he, with all the princes of Moab, he made his pronouncement. Balak, the king of Moab, brings me from Aram, from the eastern hills, saying, Come, curse Yaakov for me. Come and denounce Israel. How am I to curse those whom God has not cursed? How am I to denounce those whom Adonai has not denounced? From the tops of the rocks I see them. From the hills I behold them. Yes, a people that will dwell alone and not think itself one of the nations. Who has counted the dust of Yaakov or numbered the ashes of Israel? May I die as the righteous die. May my end be like theirs. Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? To curse my enemies is why I brought you. And here you have totally blessed them. He answered, Mustn't I take care to say just what Adonai puts in my mouth? Balak said to him, All right, come with me to another place where you can see them. You will see only some of them, not all, but you can curse them there for me. He took him through the field of Zophim to the top of the Pisgah range, built seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Balaam said to Balak, Stand here by your burnt offering while I go over there for a meeting. Adonai met Balaam, put a word in his mouth, and said, Go on back to Balak and speak as I tell you. He came to him and stood by his burnt offering with all the princes of Moab. Balak asked him, What did Adonai say? Then Balaam made his pronouncement. Get up, Balak, and listen. Turn your ears to me, son of Zippor. God is not a human who lies, or a mortal who changes his mind. When he says something, he will do it. 
When he makes a promise, he will fulfill it. Look, I am ordered to bless. When he blesses, I can't reverse it. No one has seen guilt in Yaakov or perceived perversity in Israel. Adonai, their God, is with them and acclaimed as a king among them. God, who brought them out of Egypt, gives them strength of a wild ox. Thus one can't put a spell on Yaakov. No magic will work against Israel. It can now be said of Yaakov and Israel, What is this that God has done? Here is a people rising up like a lioness. Like a lion, he rears himself up. He will not lie down till he eats up the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Balak said to Balaam, Obviously you won't curse them, but at least don't bless them. However, Balaam answered Balak, Didn't I warn you that I must do everything Adonai says? Balak said to Balaam, Come, I will take you now to another place. Maybe it will please God for you to curse them there for me. Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor, overlooking the desert. Balaam said to Balak, Build me seven altars here and prepare me seven bulls and seven rams. Balak did as Balaam said and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. When Balaam saw that it pleased Adonai to bless Israel, he didn't go as at other times to make use of divination, but looked out towards the desert. Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel encamped tribe by tribe. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he made his pronouncement. This is the speech of Balaam, son of Beor, the speech of the man whose eyes have been opened, the speech of him who hears God's words, who sees what should I sees, who has fallen yet has open eyes. How lovely are your tents, Yaakov, your encampments, Israel. They spread out like valleys, like gardens by the riverside, like succulent aloes planted by Adonai, like cedar trees next to the water. Water will flow from their branches. Their seed will have water aplenty. Their king will be higher than Agog, and his kingdom lifted high. God, who brought them out of Egypt, gives them the strength of a wild ox. They will devour the nations opposing them, break their bones, pierce them with their arrows. When they lie down, they crouch like a lion or a lioness. Who dares to rouse it? Blessed be all who bless you. Cursed be all who curse you. Balak blazed with fury against Balaam. He struck his hands together and said to Balaam, I summoned you to curse my enemies, but here you've done nothing but bless them. Three times already. Now you had better escape to your own place. I had planned to reward you very well, but now Adonai has deprived you of payment. Balaam answered Balak, Didn't I tell the messengers you sent me that even if Balak would give me his palace full of silver and gold, I could not of my own accord go beyond the word of Adonai to do either good or bad? That what Adonai says is what I would say? But now that I am going back to my own people, come, I will warn you what this people will do to your people in the Acharit Hayamim. So he made his pronouncement. This is the speech of Balaam, son of Beor, the speech of the man whose eyes have been opened, the speech of him who hears God's words, who knows what Elion knows, who sees what should I sees, who has fallen yet has open eyes. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not soon. A star will step forth from Yaakov. A scepter will arise from Israel to crush the corners of Moab and destroy all the descendants of Shet. His enemies will be his possessions, Edom and Seir possessions. Israel will do valiantly. From Yaakov will come someone who will rule, and he will destroy what is left of the city. He saw Amalek and made this pronouncement. First among the nations was Amalek, but destruction will be its end. He saw the Cani and made this pronouncement. Though your dwelling is firm, your nest set on rock, Cain will be wasted while captive to Asher. Finally, he made this pronouncement. Oh no, who can live when God does this? But ships will come from the coast of Kittim to subdue Asher and subdue Ever, but they too will come to destruction. Then Balaam got up, left, and returned to his home, and Balak too went his way. Israel stayed 
at Shittim, and there the people began whoring with the women of Moab. These women invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, where the people ate and bowed down to their gods. With Israel thus joined to Baal Peor, the anger of Adonai blazed up against Israel. Adonai said to Moshe, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them facing the sun before Adonai, so that the raging fury of Adonai will turn away from Israel. Moshe said to the judges of Israel, Each of you is to put to death those in his tribe who have joined themselves to Baal Peor. Just then, in the sight of Moshe and the whole community of Israel, as they were weeping at the entrance to the tent of meeting, a man from Israel came by, bringing to his family a woman from Midian. When Pinchas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the Cohen, saw it, he got up from the middle of the crowd, took a spear in his hand, and pursued the man from Israel right into the inner part of the tent, where he thrust his spear through both of them, the man from Israel and the woman through her stomach. Thus was the plague among the people of Israel stopped. Nevertheless, 24,000 died in the plague. Amen. It's a very powerful story. And uh, we're going to have a lesson today that I think is going to try to bring to light some things that um, we probably none of us really want to think about or hear. But particularly in the age we're in, we need to face, make a decision. Now, we just read one of the most famous, uh, longer <laughs> stories in the Bible. But what makes it so powerful and applicable to us is that it involves a Gentile prophet, a foreigner who has not attached himself to Israel, yet he knows Jehovah, God of Israel, and more astounding, the God of Israel speaks audibly to him. The main characters are, of course, Balak, king of Moab, and Balaam, the Gentile prophet. Now, Balaam is clearly well known in the region as a sorcerer and a seer. And so Balak hires him in hopes of putting a curse on Israel because Balak fears Israel and wants to thwart them from in entering into Canaan. Now, there are several attempts by Balak to coerce Balaam to do his bidding, and Balaam isn't particularly against doing so. But every time he begins to prophesy, Jehovah warns him that he should not curse Israel and that Israel has a glorious future. And after a couple of failed attempts, Balak thinks that maybe the third time will be the charm, but it wasn't to be. Balaam is starting to catch on. Finally recognizing that the Lord is pleased to bless Israel, Balaam ceased his divinations and looking for omens. And whenever, wherever this exact place was, that they went to in order for Balaam to put a curse on Israel. Balak and Balaam could apparently just kind of see this enormous Israelite encampment. Surely this is what Balak had in mind. Because as everyone in those days understood, you can't curse what you can't see. Now what happens next is a bit different than Balak's and Balaam's earlier attempts to curse Israel. Up to now, we're told that the Lord God literally put words into Balaam's mouth. But this time, the Spirit of God is said to rest upon Balaam, and so Balaam speaks not necessarily a direct oracle that God has told him to speak, but rather what Balaam now knows to be the truth. What we have, according with the presentation of this third oracle, is a little more of what we find in the New Testament, whereby it is a man 
who has God's Spirit resting upon him, teaching a lesson or addressing a problem and doing the teaching and or instructing in his own words, but using God's principles that he has been taught. Before, it was though the Lord was literally either controlling Balaam's mouth or whispering into Balaam's ear each and every sound and utterance Balaam was to make. There was just no room for an ad lib. Now, all that I just told you about this being Balaam's word from his own mind is confirmed in verse 3 when it begins, and this is the speech, this is the word of Balaam, a man whose eyes have been opened, of him who hears Jehovah's words. Now, some of our Bibles, like the complete Jewish Bible, will say in verse 4 that these are the words of one who has fallen. That really gives us the wrong idea. Because among Christians, that would mean one who has sinned, one who's fallen to sin. But what this actually means is one who has fallen prostrate prostrate before the Lord in worship. Now, so on later in verse 4, we hearken back to before Moses, to a time before the Lord told the world his formal personal name. And it goes back to a long era when men only knew God as El or El Shaddai. Our complete Jewish Bible has it right. Most Bible versions will say something like Almighty. We now know, due to very recent findings, that El Shaddai means God of the Mountain. And of course, that is the exact context of our story at this point. After all, this is the third mountain peak that Balaam has been escorted to that he might put a curse onto Israel. Well, the next several verses of Numbers chapter 24 have Balaam declaring how pleased the Lord is with Israel, what a powerful force they are in him, and that they will be even more abundant than they are now once they settle in Canaan. And further, the Lord will never cease to watch over them and bless them. Then in verse 9, we get the message that has often been repeated in this congregation and ought to be repeated every day among believers of every ilk. Blessed are they who bless you. Cursed are they who curse you. Now, I've heard it said that it's a a misuse of Scripture to apply the blessed are they who bless you, cursed are they who curse you as a demand upon the church to care for Israel and for the Jew and, and the Jewish people, because it only applied to Abraham's immediate family and Israel wasn't even created yet. But clearly here, those same words apply directly to the entire nation of Israel, does it not? There can be no doubt to whom the divinely protected group is, all of those who are Israel and all of those who have joined Israel, and who the warning is directed towards. It's directed towards Gentile nations and all groups that would, for whatever their reason, oppose Israel. Okay, King Balak now is pretty angry. He glares at Balaam, he slaps his hands together in disgust. He tells Balaam, leave. Of course, Balaam will now depart empty-handed because he did not do what he was hired to do, curse Israel. Now understand, this is a terribly serious blow to the king of Moab. He is now going to have to fight Israel without the aid of Israel being weakened by means of them being cursed. But just as it seemed that it couldn't get any worse for King Balak, it did. 
For not only doesn't Balaam curse, he blesses Moab's enemy. Balaam even goes on to describe the rather unpleasant fate that awaits the people of Moab and other Gentiles in the Transjordan region and in the land of Canaan. But Balaam isn't through. He tells the king there is something he needs to hear. Just like what I'm going to tell you in a few minutes, something you need to hear. He didn't want to hear it. And some of you may not want to hear it. Now, what he says this time is, is kind of a warning on the one hand. But on the other hand, the words continue this, this breathtaking messianic hope, even though what is predicted is to take place well into the future. Now, along with it, a prophecy of Israel's soon coming, unstoppable military victories. But it's a key biblical principle that often when a prophecy is pronounced, it happens not once, but twice. And sometimes even three times, but at different times in history under different circumstances. It happens in the near future, it happens again in the far future, it can happen in, in an intermediate time. And this is especially so as pertains to prophecies concerning the coming of Messiah. So, we get words that are familiar to us. A star rises from Jacob, a scepter from Israel. Kings are often referred to as stars in the ancient Middle East. So this future king that is predicted to come from the patriarch Jacob is going to inflict grave harm on the residents of Moab. Today we are speaking of the kingdom of Jordan. Edom says will be taken prisoner. Amalek will be wiped out forever. The saga of Balaam and Balak ends with them parting company, each heading home. So as it was for the Israelites in the end times of their desert wanderings, so it is for us as we enter our own end times, getting ever closer to that joyous second coming of our Messiah. That is, the Balaams of our past, those who are currently in our midst, and the ongoing spirit of Balaam that has and will infiltrate believers' minds and our religious organizations are doing their level best to keep us from eternity with God. And just as important to keep the Jewish people from eternity with God. It's really but a replay of the enemy fighting hard to keep the Israelites out of the Promised Land. Now, here comes the hard part today. Where does this spirit of Balaam exist in our modern era? Who are the people who harbor it? You know, a knee-jerk reaction might make the chief suspect Islam. maybe some of the Eastern religions, or even the Wiccans. Now, while all these certainly are adherents to that spirit of Balaam to agree, to a degree, there is another segment of the world's population that is much closer and more connected to us than that. It is a segment that has little idea that they harbored this spirit and would argue vehemently against such an accusation that I'm about to make. So I want to use this theme of Balaam today to open a discussion on a subject that is often dealt with emotionally, not hysterically. Instead of, instead of with what ought to be thought and deep introspection and honesty, and I just pray that I've got a, my filters working enough 
to be able to do this. I acknowledge it's touchy, and I mean to establish a position of clarity on a very serious issue that I know many of you already accept. Others are firmly on the fence. Still others are going to find it harsh to even deal with. Here's what it is. The church for the past 1,600 years is not what we were led to believe it is. All of us who could have at one time or another in our lives call ourselves churched have been let down. The saga of Balaam and Balak is in historical and in spiritual fact. Not only a prophecy of Israel's future, but also it is a prophetic prediction of the creation of a new religious institution that finally came about in the 4th century AD. About 1500 or so years after the Balaam saga. An immediately powerful institution because it was championed by the Roman Emperor Constantine. It would unwittingly be formed on a foundation of the spirit of Balaam. What is so perversely fascinating about it is that this is exactly the opposite of the spirit of Ruth, a Gentile Moabite woman who said to her Jewish mother-in-law, your people shall be my people and your God shall be my God. Because whereas Ruth left her Gentile ways, she left them behind to join with Israel and with Israel's God. The church has brought its Gentile ways with it, even as a replacement for Israel. Now, the spirit of Balaam, as we've seen in the Torah, is a double-minded spirit, which means it will try to portray itself as in God's will on the one hand, yet by the very nature of its founding principles, works against His will on the other. I want to be clear about what I'm saying. Despite the use of the same designation that we find in the Bible, for the first believers, the so-called church that Yeshua's first followers went about establishing, it bears precious little resemblance to the church that sent several Gentile bishops established in the 300s AD, the church that grew into the worldwide global body of church as we know it today. Now, how can I assert such a thing? How do I know that's the case? Because the details of how it all came about are recorded for us. For all of us to see, there's no doubt about this, what I'm about to tell you. Now, ironically, at the same time, there's also no doubt that at the molten core of this newfound religion, there is truth. There is truth. The truth that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is Messiah and Lord. And salvation comes from Him alone. Even so, the organizational institutions that arose from the birth of the Church of Rome and the hundreds of its offshoots that would come later were founded on the spirit of Balaam despite a claim of being founded on the spirit of Ruth. Here is what actual recorded history says occurred. The Church of Rome, the mother of the entire Western Church that includes Catholicism and Protestantism and all of its branches, was formed by a council of bishops at a synod in Nicaea, and then a few years later at another synod in Laodicea. Now we have the results of those meetings. They were recorded, so there's no need for speculation on it. As with any new organization, a set of rules, a set of foundational principles had to be established, including who could be part of it, 
who was excluded from it. The term for these many foundational principles that they used back then was canons. Now here are a few of those recorded canons that are pertinent to our Torah portion today. Canon number 29. Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's Day, Sunday, and if they can, resting then as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, Judaizers let them be anathema, let them be death, let them be dead from Christ. Canon number 37. It is not lawful to receive portions sent from the feasts of the Jews, biblical feasts, or from heretics, nor to feast with them. Canon number 38. It is not lawful to receive unleavened bread from Jews, nor to be partakers of their impiety. Four centuries later, at the second synod of Nicaea, Yet another canon was added to put the nail in the coffin of any remaining hope or thought that a Jew who wanted to worship Christ could be part of the church. Rather, they would be expressly excluded. As of that moment, any pretense that Gentile Roman Christianity wasn't in reality since its inception in Rome, an anti-Jewish, Gentiles only faith, well, that, that was dropped. The facade was lifted. Here are the exact words of that canon as recorded in the records of that meeting. Canon number eight. Since some of those who come from the religion of the Hebrews mistakenly think to make a mockery of Christ who is God pretending to become Christians, by deny, but denying Christ in private by both secretly continuing to observe the Sabbath, that's how they denied it, and by maintaining other Jewish practices, we decree they shall not be received to communion or at prayer or into the church, but rather let them openly be Hebrews according to their own religion. They should not baptize their children, they should not buy or possess a slave, but if one of them makes his conversion with a sincere faith and heart, pronounces his confession wholeheartedly, disclosing their practices and objects in the hope that others may be refuted and corrected, such a person should be welcomed and baptized along with his children, and care should be taken that they abandon all Hebrew practices. However, if they are not of this sort, they should certainly not be welcomed. Any questions? Brethren, what is described here is nothing less than a direct refusal of the church to operate in the spirit of Ruth. It is the clear, unequivocal, systematic adoption of a foundational Christian church rule to, to not only refrain from blessing Israel in any way, but it also orders its members to shun and to curse them. Jewish individuals would have to denounce their heritage. They would have to convert to being Gentiles if they wish to be part of the church. It is also a de facto annulment of the Torah and a reality of the entire Old Testament. The founders of Gentile Christianity in the fourth century Rome did not heed the warning of God from the book of Genesis concerning Abraham's seed. They did not heed the warning of Balaam from the book of Numbers, and they did not embrace the symbol of Ruth. And it continues this way until this day in the 21st century. With all but a few exceptions, Christians since the 4th century are Gentiles, just as Balaam was a Gentile. Now, he was a spiritual man. In fact, he was a God-fearer. That is, he absolutely believed in, he paid attention to, 
the God of Israel. He even heard audibly directly from the God of Israel, something few Christians can ever claim. At the same time, he also could not bring himself to dismiss his own long heritage of Gentile traditions and customs and beliefs and bigotries against Hebrews that are so at odds with the Torah, the, with the law of Moses, with other scriptural commands of the Father. Balaam was a spiritually oriented Gentile who knew Israel had a powerful God. And he had been given personal instruction from this God on what his relationship is to be with Israel, a relationship of humbling himself and uniting with them based upon God's covenants. God makes it clear to Balaam that because he, in God, because God has already blessed Israel, it's a done deal. This blessing can't be reversed by any man or any Gentile nation or any religious organization, no matter how hard they might try. Further, God promises he will never cease to see Israel as his chosen and set apart people. He will punish, he will discipline Israel when called for harshly, but never permanently curse them. And he will oppose any person, any nation, who tries to harm or curse or stand against his people for whatever reason that they may concoct. God told Balaam, Israel has a glorious future. He has it because they are blessed of God. Balaam said he wants to die in the righteousness that the people of Israel had been given by Jehovah, while he probably meant that he would be happy to receive any blessings that came Israel's way, he was also unwilling to actually follow through with uniting with Israel under Israel's covenants with God. So, we find Balaam over and over having to be warned off by Jehovah as he journeys to Moab with the intention of doing service to God's enemy, the king of Moab. Balaam was forever double-minded. Somehow, there was this intellectual disconnect. Balaam describes it as a blindness that he claims, finally went away and now he sees, whereby he just could not grasp that he cannot do service for a Gentile nation whose intent is to weaken or to harm Israel, and at the same time properly honor and be in harmony with the God of Israel. Can't have it both ways. Didn't stop him from trying. On numerous occasions he, he tried to be what he either saw as even-handed or trying to have it both ways. In the end, even though Balaam refused to curse Israel, for King Balak, Balaam actually later died at the hands of Israel for fighting alongside their enemies who attempted to stop Israel from entering the Promised Land. He, on the one hand, pledged friendship to Israel, but on the other hand, betrayed them at his first opportunity. See, this is a balancing act that so many church leaders attempt today in trying to provide equal support to both Israel and to their enemies. In reality, it is trying to retain the spirit of Balaam while claiming the spirit of Ruth. Ever since I discovered the Hebrew roots of my trust in Yeshua, as you have, my faith, our faith, has been revived so that truth might finally blossom in us. At the same time, I've asked myself, I think you probably have as well. If you haven't, I kind of wonder why not. 
How did the church become as it is? How did it get here from there? It is perplexing. It's a question that honestly didn't take a great deal of work to find out that in reality it's because of its very formation. In so many ways, Balaam is the symbolic predecessor of the Gentile Roman Church. Many of the mainstream institutional church denominations pronounce Israel no longer has a glorious future. Instead, that glorious future has been taken away from them by God, turned over to the Gentile church. Actually, one of the more widely accepted church doctrines says that God has even abandoned Israel and rejected his people for all time. This is false. But it's also self destructive foolishness to think that as God fearers, we can have it both ways. If we want truly to be at peace with God through obedience to Him, then to do anything else than to work actively to bless and to defend Israel as a nation, to help individual Jews to find their Messiah, is to put us in the footsteps into the mindset of Balaam. Sadly, bizarrely, it's the church that has been their primary oppressors for centuries. And during those centuries of Jewish exile and dispersion, especially prior to the rebirth of Israel, it should have been the church's unequivocal duty to stand with them. To befriend them, to comfort those Jewish families when they needed us the most. We should have blessed them. We should have just welcomed them into the fold of Yeshua followers just as they were as Jews, but we didn't. Instead, they were told they were Christ killers. God hated them. So, they were explicitly excluded. In fact, many so-called Christian nations, including the USA, by the way, completely turned their backs on them when they were being murdered by the hundreds of thousands. And a few Christian nations, such as Germany, sought their total extermination, professing Christ's teachings as the reason for it. I mean, this is very painful for me to admit. Very hard to face because I grew up in the church. I was saved in the church. Now, however, I'm forced to separate myself from that institution of Balaam. I have no choice. I know the truth. And instead, I have to join the growing movement of believers that has the goal of reviving the precepts of the biblical faith that Christ taught and coming to God in the spirit of Ruth. So many ways the church has done tremendous good. So many ways. Yet I can't remain attached and identified with something that openly seeks to curse Israel. Something that demands Jews must give up their biblical Hebrew faith and identity in order to follow their own Jewish Messiah. God calls us who seek a true biblical faith in my Messiah Yeshua not to try to reform that institution, but rather to come out of her, my people. Come out. Flee from the world system that is metaphorically called Babylon in the Bible, a world system to which the church owes its existence. Its allegiance shares many of its foundational principles. So what do we do? How do we apply today's Torah portion to our lives in a real, tangible term? As always, the proof of our faith in the God of Israel and the rightness of it is reflected in our choices, in our actions, in our behavior. What 
Yeshua metaphorically called our fruit. It begins with accepting the historical, biblical Messiah Yeshua and obeying what He and His Father command us. Next is to shun supporting Israel's enemies and the people that do. We must not be a party to sending supplies or money to the Palestinians, to the Gazans, or joining with our European allies to help apply political pressure upon Israel on their enemies' behalf. We must not join with so much of the Christian world and virtually all of the secular world out of a misplaced anti-biblical sense of fairness or of equity or of mercy in order to push Israel into dividing the land that was covenanted to them by the Lord. We must stand firmly with Israel against deeding to the Muslims for their capital Syria, city, the very place Messiah is going to set foot again when he returns Jerusalem, or to allow Islam to continue to maintain a pagan shrine and worship center where the holy temple of God once existed, and it will again. We must take the truth that God's chosen people remain as the Hebrew people, the Israelites, and that Yeshua is Israel's Messiah as foretold in the Hebrew Scriptures, and that it is Gentiles that have been graciously given away to be grafted into them, for us to join them, that we might partake of their covenants. We must sincerely declare as Ruth, your God, O Israel, shall be my God. Your people, O Israel, you shall be my people. Order has to be restored. That's our job at this point in redemption history. Would you please rise? For more teaching and information, visit us online today. Come and be a part of our fellowship here at The Seed. Enjoy worshiping and learning God's Word with us.